Right. Good afternoon, everybody. Hello. Great. If you could all just sit down and make yourselves comfortable, in a very short space of time, you're going to hear some of our luminaries talk from this podium. I'm just taking up a little bit of space before them. Uh, my name's John Smith. I'm from Newcastle, and uh, I'm the conference chair, as luck would have it. Uh, we're in Lisbon. Uh, 1755 was the, site, was the Lisbon earthquake, a catastrophic event in the 18th century that uh, led to a very uh, epic poem by Voltaire, whose primary purpose really was to promote rational thought and examination of the world using reason and science. I think that's what this is meeting is for, and I want you to hear the latest evidence from leaders in the field, question it and learn, and hopefully this will be an amuse-bouche for you in that way. We have a very varied programme. I put some of the topics on here. It's not comprehensive. Professor Dirk Donker was the chair of the scientific committee, and like a swan on, on a lake, he produced it flawlessly, but I'm sure was working very hard beneath the surface. The steering committee are incredibly grateful for him for pulling it together. We are having, or well, we have arranged to share some of the sessions with our partner organisations, and I hope you find this useful. We want you to have fun make contacts with your peers in other countries, and enjoy Lisbon as well as learning. I'll now hand over to Dr. Graham McLaren, the ELSO Chair. <clears throat> Good afternoon, everybody, and uh, welcome to Lisbon. Oops, just hang on a sec while we load the slides. So I'm, I'm the current ELSO president, um, and uh, I'm uh, not going to take up too much of your time. I just want to draw your attention to some of the, the wider things that ELSO has been up to recently uh, outside of Europe. So first of all, the ELSO registry, which has been in existence since 1989, is approaching its 200,000th patient. It doesn't seem to me that long ago that the ELSO registry had just cleared 50,000. So um, it's really exploding, and that's all thanks to you and the international ECMO community. And obviously, quantity doesn't equal quality. Nonetheless, this is still the biggest uh, repository of ECMO patient data in the world, uh, and is a very valuable resource to all of us with important uh, research questions. Um, we have just updated the April 2023 uh, registry report, so this includes all the data from 2022. And I don't propose to go through this. You all know that it's split into age categories and indication categories, and this leads to differences in outcome. This is uh, freely available on the ELSO website. ELSO has just completed a high-fidelity simulation center dedicated to, for nothing but to teach ECMO simulation. Um, and the inaugural cohort went through their first uh, <coughs> training program uh, just a few weeks ago. Uh, it's a shame Dr. Bartlett can't be here. He was unable to come on this occasion, but uh, you can see him here in this photo, still interested in ECMO in his early 80s, still driving the field forward. We have uh, guidelines continue to be updated, both new guidelines and updates of previous ones. Uh, you can access these free of charge either at the ELSO website uh, or uh, through the journal of the American Society of Artificial Organs, who have uh, graciously published all these guidelines for free. We have just reorganized the guidelines committee, and this uh, co committee is going to be helmed by Giles Peak, who is known uh, by everybody, and also Matteo Di Nardo, who's right there. So the two of them and their two vice chairs and the rest of the uh, committee will be pushing guidelines forward. One important principle that we wanted to do with the guidelines, which is now in force, is that we don't have guidelines published by just one group. You know, we, we're not interested in the the Toronto approach to, to respiratory ECMO. We want representatives from each chapter making these truly global guidelines. Uh, ELSO has recently released uh, monographs, one of which is a, a very detailed uh, group of simulation scenarios for neonatal and pediatric patients, and the other is a monograph uh, really doing a deep dive into eCPR. Two other uh, books that you may not have seen 
This is the new edition of the ELSO Red Book, which was released in Boston last year. Uh, I think it's the best Red Book to date, but I'm hopelessly biased. Um, as you can see, it's not thin, um, and it's written by more than 230 ECMO experts from around the world. So I think this represents certainly one of them, if not the most important single uh, reference for ECMO right now. And it covers uh, not just clinical care for neonatal uh, patients, for pediatric patients, or for adult patients, but everything else that you could possibly imagine surrounding the use of ECMO. Um, another book which I'm pleased to announce is this one. So this was helmed by uh, Professor Roberto LaRusso from Maastricht, and it is uh, a dedicated monograph to um, <clears throat> post-cardiotomy mechanical circulatory support in adult patients. So again, very, very detailed, fantastic group of authors, and it's literally just been printed um, and should be available online soon. One thing that ELSO has also done was released uh, ELSO Foundations uh, toward the end of 2021, which is an online course going through the basics, um, but very, very comprehensively to help uh, train people. And more than 1,000 people have, have taken up this course, and we hope more will do in the future. Some other upcoming meetings, the SEEKMO meeting, which is a, a meet, it's a, I think a two-day meeting dedicated to ECMO specialists, uh, is in Florida. Uh, Giles Peake, again, is the, is the chair of this meeting and tells me that if you can, there's, uh, being serious here, there's actually a competition. The faster you can change out an ECMO circuit component will get you discounts to get into the course. Um, and also, if you've attended this conference, uh, you also get a discount. And it's about two hours away from Disneyland. So if you fancy a trip to Florida, this is a good way of tying it in. Also, later this year, we have our uh, annual ELSO meeting in Seattle. Um, which promises to be uh, very exciting. And then lastly, um, from ELSO's point of view, we have a meeting in South Korea. You know, some of you may know that uh, the Asia-Pacific meeting and the Latin American meeting are held every alternate year. So this year it's Asia's turn and there should be a great meeting in Seoul. But enough about other meetings. We're here to enjoy this one. Um, and thank you again for making the trip to Portugal. I hope you have a fantastic conference. And I'll pass over to the EuroLSO president, Nick Barrett. Thank you very much, Graham, and, and thank you all for coming. Um, welcome very much to Portugal. Welcome to Lisbon. Uh, on behalf of the steering and scientific committees for EuroLSO, we are very excited to be here. It's taken a lot of work um, to, to reach this point. We'll go through some of that and some of those people shortly, but uh, it is for you, it's your Congress, and we really hope that you enjoy it and you get as much out of it as you can. So, as we've just heard, uh, ELSO, is, ELSO is a family, a global family, uh, with many chapters. Uh, Europe also is, is the European chapter, um, covering Europe and Israel, uh, as well as the UK. And, um, <laughs> We, 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 didn't, we didn't kick us, we didn't kick the UK out with Brexit. Um, we are a charity. Uh, we're very much a charitable organisation within Europe, and we have some key goals. And those goals are around education, some of which you'll experience um, at the various sessions over the next couple of days. Research, and we're very enthusiastic about some of our European partners and partnership organisations, including. European Society of Cardiology, Society of Intensive Care Medicine, um, and the Pediatric and Neonatal Intensive Care Society. The ELSO Steering Committee um, consists of about 16 of us uh, from all over Europe, uh, and uh, we meet pretty much monthly, but uh, a couple of times a year in person to try and uh, improve our educational and, and research offerings, and this is the, the group that met for the last few days. Importantly for this meeting, we have a very, um, very strong scientific committee. We're always looking for new members, so do keep an eye out on the website uh, for both steering and scientific committee membership. Um, and they have worked incredibly hard uh, to bring you the, the Congress. Um, we have um, ably led by John and Dirk as the scientific committee chair. 
We have 26 sessions uh, that we've just completed in the pre-Congress where we've had about 500 people, which is a fabulous uh, turnout. And then 30 sessions, and you saw the range of topics uh, that John showed earlier, with about nearly 1,500 uh, of us that will be here until Saturday afternoon. And of course, we couldn't have done it without uh, Marisa and Francesco, uh, two of the Portuguese physicians who are heavily involved in ECMO and has, have helped us uh, during this process. Some of our goals are to support research. Um, we are very keen on collaborative uh, pan-European uh, approaches to research, and we provide grants, which I'll go into uh, later on in this session. And one of the things that we're very proud of is, is over COVID, um, the Euro ECMO COVID study group had a, a data sharing exercise where we rapidly pulled together data from 200 centers within Europe um, to share and compare the outcomes from COVID. That's recently come out uh, in um, The Lancet, Respiratory Medicine, uh, and I would commend you to it. But it's a, it's a pan-European effort. Um, many of you, many of your centers will have contributed, and we thank you very much for your efforts. We have a, an association with Perfusion. It's the, the journal of Euro also. Um, we try to put many of our articles into Perfusion. And importantly, um, if you follow the link that's up there now, that will take you straight through to the supplement for this year, where a select group of papers, as well as all the abstracts for the um, Congress, will be, they're all cited there. So that's just been released to coincide with the start of the Congress and is available for free on the uh, Perfusion website. They're part of the SAGE publishing group. Our education um, is another really important part for us. And you've heard from Graham about the, the ELSO online foundation course. So both this and the practical courses, we've brought together a faculty from the, around the world. Many of Europeans have contributed to this to both create the, the outlines for the programs as well as uh, all of the, the content that's on those websites. And if you follow that QR code, it will take you straight through to the online foundations course, which is about 20 hours of online education. We've also been delivering train the trainers courses in simulation, uh, which we did with uh, Jordi Riera uh, in Barcelona uh, just late last year. We have regular monthly, near monthly uh, webinars and lots of educational collaborations. We're very keen on, on members to, uh, to join us, to participate in the society and the working groups, which I'll come up to later, um, to participate in the education, to access the guidelines. Um, becoming a member is very straightforward, either as an individual member or as a centre member, um, and your centre can contribute to the, um, the ELSO registry. As Graham said, the ELSO registry is the largest registry on ECLS. It's hugely beneficial for audit, quality assurance, and quality improvement, as well as observational research. We all know that there have been issues with the changes in law and GDPR in particular across Europe and the UK. Uh, but we're, we are working on this. We'll be providing some advice uh, later on this year on our website as to how your centres can start negotiating some of these issues with your local uh, information governance offers and lawyers. And, of course, the Congress could not be here without our wonderful sponsors uh, who help to keep the costs down um, and help to uh, support us as an organisation and you as attendees. Uh, thank you all very much for coming, and I really hope you enjoy the next couple of days. Thanks. We're going on to our year in review. And it's my great pleasure to welcome to the microphone uh, Matteo Dinardo, who's going to deal with paediatrics first. Good afternoon, everybody. Thanks, Mr. Chairman and President, for having me to present this year in review. 
So this 2022 and beginning of 23 it was very, very fruitful, and uh, I would like to start this talk uh, with pediatrics. And uh, one of the first articles that I'm going to mention is this one. It's the executive summary of the second international guidelines for the diagnosis and management of pediatric RDS. As you can see, even though with low uh, certainty of evidence, there is ECMO at the top. We recognize that in children we do not have randomized control trial comparing mechanical ventilation versus ECMO in parts. We do not have any threshold, but there is a scientific rationale behind the use of ECMO, and these guidelines suggest the use of VV ECMO possibly when there is no cardiac dysfunction. What about the management of the respiratory failure? There is a lot of uncertainty surrounding the use of tracheostomy in children receiving ECMO, but there are also uh, potential benefits about reducing sedation, mobilization, but there is also the risk of bleeding. This analysis of uh, the ELSO registry show that uh, during the years, uh, the numbers of tracheostomies increased, but so far uh, there is a low percentage of uh, tracheostomy on ECMO done at the moment. Uh, however, the risk of bleeding is not so high, around 12% in this court. In line with the respiratory support, uh, we also can say that uh, flexible bronchoscopy is feasible during ECMO. Uh, it's uh, associated with uh, poor low, low rate of complication, uh, and it may improve lung mechanics. Uh, however, the suggestion is to do early in the ECMO run uh, to improve the outcomes. What about neuromonitoring? This is a, a summary uh, from uh, United States uh, collecting 47 uh, uh, pediatric hospital. And as you can see, there is a wide variation in the use of EEG among pediatric patient. Uh, this uh, depends on uh, the current attitudes of the centers. However, there are centers that use a lot of EEG, centers that use low rate of EEG, but the diagnosis of seizure is the same, as well as the diagnosis of stroke with the use of MRI. What about the management of native lung during ECMO? There are several papers coming out. Uh, what I found useful is that uh, all of them uh, come with the same uh, numbers in terms of reducing the mechanical ventilation setting, which is around uh, to maintain a PEEP of 20, a PEEP of 20, a PEEP of 10, a respiratory rate of 20. Uh, however, what we know so far is that uh, after 24 hours of ECMO, maintaining high FiO2 or maintaining high level of PEEP is associated to poor outcome. It is interesting to know how during those 20 years, uh, also the bridge to lung transplant was uh, uh, managed also in children, and there was an increase of its use. Uh, however, we can say that uh, bridging with ECMO or bridging with mechanical ventilation, this patient to the lung transplant is associated to uh, an increased odds of, mo of mortality. However, what I found interesting in this paper coming from Boston is that if we compare the final outcome at one year in terms of mortality of retransplantation, we can see here that uh, there is not a big and significant difference in terms of retransplantation or mortality when we compare mechanical ventilation alone, ECMO alone, or with patients that received directly lung transplant. Going to cardiac ECMO, we can say that uh, this is one of the interesting paper coming out also from the ELSO registry these years, and uh, uh, it impacts the effect of uh, um, myocarditis, where the use of uh, ECMO in myocarditis is particularly useful. But what came out from uh, this study, which I think is uh, very important, is the time from intubation to cannulation is associated to improve outcomes. And this is something that it could be planned in advance when you decide to put uh, a patient on ECMO for myocarditis. Another interesting paper coming from Boston, uh, from the group of Ravi and Francesca Sperotto, first order, 
left atrial decompression in pediatric patients supported with ECMO for failure to win from cardiopulmonary bypass. This is a propensity uh, score weighted analysis uh, adjusting from baseline difference from uh, patients. And uh, there was a group of patients who did uh, receive the left atrial decompression and the other group that didn't receive. The, uh, what they found is that the left atrial decompression was independently associated with a decrease in hospital adverse event considered as mortality or uh, transplantation or conversion to VAD. What about neonate? One of the interesting things that uh, we got so far with the ELSO registry is that we have to take care of reducing the gas exchange, in particular PaCO2 after the beginning of the ECMO run. This is something that has been demonstrated this year also in pediatric. There is a, a paper from uh, the group of uh, uh, Lakshmi Raman saying that there is uh, a very strong association with acute neurologic event if you decrease so uh, too much, too, 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 uh, too far um, the, um, uh, the PaCO2. Uh, aga again, again on uh, neurologic monitoring, uh, we can say that um, neurologic complications are important in, uh, in children, also in children re receiving VV ECMO. And this study, a retrospective study coming of uh, 20 years of uh, data from the ELSO registry, said that the association of a cephalid drainage cannula plus a double lumen cannula in uh, neonates and infant, uh, unfortunately, it does not decrease the, um, uh, the occurrence of neurologic event, uh, but increase instead the rate of complication. Something more about uh, children and neonates, uh, there is a significant reduction of um, variability in the standardized mortality ratio among centers. There are centers that perform better and centers that instead do not perform better for CDH. And of course, in the best centers, the rate of complication is very low. Something new about the pump, there, are, uh, there has been uh, this uh, paper suggesting that it is possible to use uh, an adult pump to treat neonate and infants just modifying the, the cardio help, uh, reducing the priming volume from uh, the standard 500 ml to 300 ml. Uh, but again, uh, there is also the risk of uh, complication due to the mm, uh, blood stagnation at the level of the centrifugal pump that goes beyond the oxygenator. ECMO and coagulation, uh, this is a very important study that we had uh, this year in uh, pediatric critical care medicine, uh, studying uh, and evaluating uh, uh, the von Willebrand factor in children. Uh, von Willebrand factor is a disease, uh, acquired von Willebrand factor is so important, but monitoring uh, of uh, of uh, high molecular weight uh, uh, multimers is not efficient and is not associated to, um, to bleeding. Uh, what about antithrombin? Antithrombin supplementation is important uh, and, in, uh, and especially important for anticoagulation in, um, in uh, heparin-based physiology. Uh, the, the prevalence uh, of antithrombin deficiency is high, uh, and it is possible to reduce uh, the supplementation applying um, a, a protocol of heparin resistance at bedside. Uh, the future says that we need to look in uh, other fields in terms of anticoagulation, and in particular on the field of bivalirudine. This is a very nice uh, systematic review from Jaya Speak. And, um, the future is bright for, um, for uh, bivalirudine. Again, ECMO in COVID. Uh, this year have been published the results from the US court. Uh, the use of ECMO in COVID is very, very limited, uh, and, but it is associated like the European data with very good survival. And when ECMO is no longer medical appropriate, it is useful and uh, to think about strategies to improve and to take care of uh, end of quality of life. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Matteo. It's very difficult to come to fold everything into this. Uh, next, we've got Matthias Schmidt, who's going to do a similarly eloquent disclosure on adults. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to Lisbon. So uh, we will discuss uh, the highlights of uh, adult ECMO. So my challenge uh, for it is to try to summarize a very prolific year and when you type on PERMEB uh, um, extracorporeal membrane oxygenation with a merge term, you see that during that year, more than 1,675 paper uh, were published. So I have to summarize it in eight minutes. So I need to speed up a little bit. 
so first of all, regarding uh, VV ECMO for severe ADS, we have this uh, very important paper uh, led by Roberto Lourso on behalf of uh, the ULSO, um, which was a prospective multicenter observational study, uh, which uh, pay attention to patients during the first wave with a six months uh, outcome. So a very large cohort, more than 1,215 patients. As you see, 50% of them died in hospital uh, in this large cohort. And it was surprising and very interesting to see that if you look at the status of survivor as six months after ECMO, only 24% of them were back to full-time work, and uh, quite a large proportion of them have still uh, a persistent cognitive symptoms. It was 13%. It was also the time to review what we have done during this uh, pandemic of nearly two years. And this is another uh, European um, cohort with, uh, which gather uh, 1,345 patients from 21 experienced ECMO center from all waves. Um, so it was interesting because we looked for um, independent risk factor. It was interesting to see that the variant itself impact the prognosis of those patients on ECMO with the worst prognosis uh, for the Delta variant. It was also interesting to see that the time from ICU admission to intubation, which is frequently not considered uh, in the ECMO decision, impact on the final prognosis. Beyond the, 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 the recovery of the lung function for those patients, it was also interesting to look at uh, uh, the psychological impact of, uh, for this patient one year after. And in that study, uh, it shown that this ECMO patient uh, rescued during the first wave, quite a large number of them still suffering from uh, uh, significant anxiety symptoms. 42% uh, had significant depression symptoms. 42% were at risk uh, for PTSD after a year and only a small proportion of them were back to their initial work. And something which has which never been explored is to say that when you ask to this patient at one year, uh, only 31% of them um, said that they had a similar sex drive as before COVID-19. Uh, studies focus on specific subgroup have tried to improve the clinical practices. Uh, this one focused on obese patients and uh, with several statistical analysis uh, showing and confirming uh, the obese paradox, meaning that patients with uh, obese patients on ECMO had a much better prognosis compared to non-obese patients. So clearly, uh, the conclusion is very important for clinical practice. Uh, there is no upper limit of BMI uh, indicating futility of ECMO treatment. So it should not be considered other contraindication. Another important paper focused on a specific subgroup. This is a subgroup of adults receiving hematopoietic uh, cell transplantation. This is an international expert statement, a position paper, uh, which concludes at the end that um, hematopoietic cell transplantation can no longer be considered as an absolute contraindication to ECMO. Uh, it's also important, it's very important to well select the patient, but also important to do better ECMO. And this uh, prospective international cohort study uh, focus on transfusion, focus on, on the hemoglobin level, has tried to improve our, our, our practice. Uh, and this uh, study, uh, led by uh, Genaro Matucci from uh, Italy, shown that in a time-dependent Cox model, hemoglobin concentration of less than seven grams per deciliter was consistently associated with higher risk of death in the intensive care compared with other higher hemoglobin concentration. And if you focus on transfusion, you see that receiving transfusion uh, uh, when the hemoglobin level is lower than several was associated with a lower risk of death only in that category, meaning if you transfuse a patient when the patient has a, a hemoglobin level over seven, it doesn't impact uh, the prognosis. Regarding the field of cardiogenic shock, uh, we are very happy because we have seen the first randomized controlled trial in that field uh, that year, so uh, published in circulation, 
122 patients randomly uh, assigned to uh, immediate VHMO or no immediate VHMO. The primary endpoint was death from any cause or resuscitated uh, circulatory arrest or another uh, mechanical circulatory support. It focused of, on patients with rapidly de deteriorated cardiogenic shock or severe cardiogenic shock patient. Uh, the hypothesis was quite um, optimistic, 50% reduction of the primary endpoint. And unfortunately, uh, this study is negative, but very interesting to go deeper in, in to go in, in the details of that study, and I'm sure uh, uh, this study will be highly discussed uh, during that meeting. Another important uh, uh, study in the field of cardiogenic shock is um, that study based on a large cohort uh, from four, in four countries, uh, which focus on the timing of uh, LV unloading and they compare early active LV unloading or delayed active uh, LV unloading with Impella on top of ECMO, and they elegantly show that early active LV unloading was associated with a lower 30-day mortality risk and a higher likelihood of successful uh, weaning from ventilation without any additional uh, complication. It's not an RCT, but uh, uh, at least we are progressing uh, on that field, and probably the timing is also very important. To, uh, to end that presentation, I will uh, um, show you uh, the big news in, uh, in, in, the, um, in the field of refractory cardiac arrest, and we have a new, uh, a new RCT, so we have a third RCT published, uh, very, uh, published a few weeks ago, um, uh, published in New England Journal of Medicine, so uh, this uh, ARCT uh, randomized uh, 70 patients for in the extracorporeal CPR group and 64, 64 patients in the conventional CPR group. Uh, it focused on patients with initial, initial ventricular arrhythmia. And uh, as you see, um, in this patient with refractory out-of-hospital cardiac arrest uh, caused by uh, initial ventricular arrhythmia, eCPR on conventional CPR had similar effect on survival with a favorable neurological outcome at 30 days. It was quite different from the previous uh, SCT published uh, in the previous year, but uh, if you go in details again uh, in, in all these uh, RCT um, on, on um, refractory cardiac arrest, you see that in this last paper, uh, the, the time between the arrest to arrival at emergency department was much longer for, compared to the Prague study, for example. Same for the time between the cardiac arrest and ECLS flow. It was much longer, more than uh, 12 minutes longer, and even the procedure of cannulation was also uh, uh, longer. So logistic is essential, and I'm sure this paper will be discussed in the meeting. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mathieu. Uh, now, year in review by Joanne Fox. Uh, good afternoon and welcome um, to Lisbon. So, um, I'm going to just talk to you about the, the advances or publications in nursing and IHPs. But first of all, when I was looking at this, I was reflecting on the URLC Congress itself. And I've been really fortunate to have attended um, 10 of the 11th Congre Congresses. And not only has it been a really excellent way to see some very beautiful cities, I've met a lot of people, I've made friends, and I've learned a lot. But when I look through where we were in Rome, there was hardly any representation from nurses and AHPs. But as we moved through the years, we went through um, a period when the nurses had a standalone um, Congress, which worked really successfully, to this year in Lisbon, where we've worked really hard to integrate nursing and AHPs into the whole program. And so you'll note there's nursing speaking in many of the sessions, moderating with our AHP co colleagues. And so for me, it's really, really heartening to see the Congress mimicking the care at the bedside and being truly multi-professional. So when I looked at the publications, I um, looked at this non-medical staff publications, so uh, carers at the bedside, and I pulled in uh, my AHP colleagues. And most of the, uh, 
uh, publications sort of fell into the three themes, really, staffing and education, mobilising or rehabilitating, and that's from our very tiniest patients on ECMO to our adults, and then, interesting, the well-being of staff. So staffing and education was probably the largest group of, uh, of articles, and the conclusions really reiterated um, a lot of the previous research you know, encouraging teams to focus on well-structured training courses that were based on um, competency frameworks. There was also a real emphasis on um, fostering an a environment of continual learning, and that's not just for the nurses and the ECMO specialists, but also our allied health professionals, especially our physiotherapists, who are so integral to especially the rehabilitation of our patients. The potential cost savings of a nurse-led um, ECMO service are well recognised now. But there was um, research that showed that maybe on the smaller centres, the lower volume centres, it may be safer and more cost effective to remain with a perfusion-led service. So mobilising or rehabilitating um, our patients. So Euro also supported a survey which shone a spotlight on the different approaches to mobilising patients or rehabilitating patients across European centres and showed that most centres actively rehabilitated their patients, but how much and how far they went with this was really dependent on the staffing and the resources. In paediatrics, um, there was a, a much said about the benefits and the barriers to safely rehabilitating the patients, and this is reflected in the adult literature as well, with a recommendation that all guidelines didn't just focus on um, pre-mobilisation checklists and safety, but also obviously during, but also after mobilisation. And finally, on to wellbeing. I think we all learned during the pandemic of the importance of um, not only looking after our patients, but also looking after each other. And the increase in publications and focus on this was replicated within the ECMO um, publications as well. There was a real focus on embedding psychological support into teams and into our workplaces to ensure well-being. There's an identification of what factors may be contributed to, to um, burnout in nurses, but I think this applies to all of us. So one was experience or lack of experience, workloads, ill-defined models of care, um, all contributed to nurses developing burnout. Uh, there was one article which um, really interestingly spoke very much about debriefs, saying how valuable they were in, for acute moral distress, so we all should be debriefing after an event, but were less effective um, in decreasing chronic moral distress, just really um, reinforcing the need for us to have some you know, support within the, our workforces um, for the whole team. And nurses, or all of us, we can't provide good care um, unless we enjoy good physical and mental health ourselves. And this was um, reiterated throughout um, their publications. So thank you very much. I'm really looking forward to the next session, um, which is on wellbeing. Um, so I hope a lot of you stay for that, because um, I think that's one of the most important things that's come out of the literature that I reviewed. Enjoy Lisbon and learn loads. Thanks, Joanne. And uh, to round this up, we've got Lee now to talk about innovation. Thank you very much. Good afternoon and welcome to Lisbon, also from my side. Uh, there's a lot of movement in the field of uh, technology, so it's impossible to cover it all in, oh, I got eight minutes. Um, but I'll try to highlight the most important uh, things. Uh, what I'm shortly going to address is some uh, data on recently EU-approved devices and some worth mentioning US-approved devices. What I'm not going to address are the new devices, I'm sorry, I wasn't aware of, uh, new technology with no reported data, so I couldn't find it, uh, or technology which other can explain better, such as the ongoing research in novel coating, you have to talk to Gail about this, and the wearable oxygenators or the implantable placenta. Um, Jutta Ahrens uh, will give a talk about this in one of the sessions. Uh, let's start with cannula, the pediatric cannula. You know, since uh, Jorgen cannula, the development cannula, left the market, there was only one option, one alternative, that was the uh, bicaval uh, Avalon cannula. 
and there was a lot of, were a lot of problems reported concerning uh, placement and migration problems. There was even a paper stating this. And recently, there was a survey amongst American pediatricians looking at the habits, the canalization habits of the uh, uh, surgeons in uh, VA, VV ECMO, and they saw an enormous switch from VV to VA ECMO because of uh, the lack of uh, appropriate cannula, um, especially the risk of um, uh, atrial uh, injury, cardiac injury, and some inexperience. So there really needs to be some extra training, with, which was already reported in that previous paper. Luckily, in the US, there is a new cannula on the market for uh, pediatric VV ECMO, which is the Crescent pediatric cannula. comes in small sizes. It's not yet available in uh, Europe, and some unpublished series mention good support, some need for surgical repositioning, and only one case of uh, atrial uh, perforation. The adult crescent uh, has been on the market since some time, and we have now also some data stating that this is a cannula which can be placed without major adverse effects. It's uh, the, the minor bleeding, uh, uh, good flows, little recirculation, um, also minor positioning issues. It has been reported to be placed also with the use of mobile X-ray, avoiding the transportation of your critically ill or infectious patients for fluoroscopy. There was only one adverse event which was reported, at least which I found in the literature. It was a broken um, dual lumen cannula, two centimeter distal from the skin insertion site. The Protect Duo uh, cannula family, you probably all know, there have been some creative applications for this cannula, such as uh, in a dual drainage, uh, right atrium uh, pulmonary artery drainage in v for VA ECMO, or as a dual return cannula. And some of the authors of these papers are here, so feel free to, to uh, communicate with them. Then the Protect Dual Rapid Deployment Cannula is also a dual lumen cannula which is traditionally placed via the femoral uh, vessel and um, here it has been deployed to be used together with a Centrimac as a temporary assist device via an apical uh, sewing cuff transversing the aortic valve. There have been some less expensive new unloading strategies we've I've seen this uh, appearing such as this one. It's uh, a six French pigtail introduced into the left ventricle via the radial artery uh, and it was reported to give sufficient unloading in this case. Then this technology, I don't know it, it's technology, this is not new, the pulse catheter, but now what is new, that it is reported to be used together with uh, a VA ECMO, um, and it was just one case, and it was feasible, and it gets sufficient support in this case report, uh, and it resulted, it was reported to result in less hemolysis than the um, uh, impella pump. Then there is this, the i the Pulsatail uh, centrifugal pump. Um, they just had a safety and feasibility study stating that um, it is safe in use, but of course further investigations are required to see uh, what are the optimal flows, uh, what are the required pulse pressures, which kind of sizes you need it in this application. The transportable device is very important uh, recently. Uh, we have some lightweight and transport safe devices with a lot of integrated monitoring tool, such as the Eurosat Colibri. There has been a report of feasibility and safety. And we also have the Spectrum. I mentioned it. I didn't find any scientific data, but it's worth mentioning because they have this portable hyperbaric ventilation. And now I just discovered here in the exhibition hall this live motion device. Feel free and, and have a look at it. It's not yet a CE market. There are some devices in the US, um, devices who got FDA clearance, which are very, very, very simple without any monitoring tools, uh, just rotational speed. And um, they are reported to be used uh, in combination with devices who can have a display of extra um, 
um, monitoring and safety issues like the smart Nautilus oxygenator, which displays pressures and, and um, um, saturations. Another new mobile device is this Abiomet Breed uh, device. Again, not CE marked. It has be, received FDA clearance and it's aimed to move away from the ICU, eventually going home. Then there have been some elegant alternatives introduced to um, elegant alternatives to integrated pressure monitoring. Uh, this one I found. Um, it's the uh, Compass. Uh, pressure device. It's a di disposable vascular pressure device. It doesn't have FDA clearance nor CI marking for use in ECMO, but it has been used and reported to be handy and safe. And then this is something that looks very exciting. It's a non-invasive optical blood sensor for extracorporeal PO2 and PCO2 measurement. Currently, no FDA clearance nor CE marketing, but they're working on it. Something else that is interesting, especially if you do some networking, is this universal pump speed control device, which is able to uh, control different types of centrifugal pumps. It has an adapter where you can fit different brands, uh, but again, also not available. Uh, here in Europe, and uh, it just had an FDA 510 pre-market notification. Then the recent technology for out of hospital is CPR. It's the CARL. They do a lot of uh, marketing here, so go and, and, and have a look over there. They, they just released a report of the first uh, 10 applications, um, and um, there's a lot of extra and early monitoring possible in the ECPR patients, but of course, first, further investigation towards the benefit uh, still has to be uh, done. Some new strategies, you know, this reverse pumping, the retrograde trial off, um, it was introduced in pediatrics to avoid those bridges, and later on it was adapted by some cardiac, uh, adult cardiac uh, centers. Uh, despite the uh, numerous reported safety concerns and despite the recent um, alerts of uh, clot inlet uh, um, evidence. So just to say it's, it's really important, especially if you start to work uh, pr with products and you use them off-label, just work together with your uh, technical specialists to investigate it properly before you clinically use. Um, and just having said this, I'm still within my time. Um, we have, we used to have a Euro ELSO Devices and Technology Committee. It was a bit uh, in the winter sleep last year, but we're going to re-establish it. So feel free to contact our chair. Uh, it's uh, Maximilian Maltertainer. Um, so um, it's important to have all the disciplines on board uh, to have good translational communication. So apologies for all I, those I couldn't mention, and kindly visit the exhibition and the technical oriented session, and you'll hear more about everything I very briefly mentioned. Thank you. My great thanks to all those expert speakers for delivering the program within time, which I think is a notable achievement. I'm now going to hand over to Nick again. Um, thank you very much. Um, it gives me great pleasure just to discuss a few little advances that we've, um, we've made within Euro also um, that you can very much be involved in. We very much need you to be involved in and we're um, keen to get these up and off the ground. So the, the first is our surveys. Um, we've been very successful in our surveys uh, over time. Um, we've had a number of publications, um, and we're looking to support sort of four surveys across a variety of topics each year. Uh, we will provide the scientific committee to ensure that there's adequate scientific scrutiny and to ensure that there is European and global reach, depending on the, the nature of the survey. Just some, some examples of uh, some of those that have been published just in the last uh, year, looking at um, training, looking at the availability of ECMO across Europe, COVID clearly, um, 
the children, and particularly PIMS TS, which was uh, sort of very, uh, very problematic in that second wave, um, and also looking at some of our allied health topics. So it's an area where we're enthusiastic to support. Uh, we've got a good track record, and we'd like your, your ideas and your help. Uh, this is one of our current um, surveys, um, which you can, you'll see up on the screens around the Congress, uh, um, looking at um, uh, Ensure, looking at end-of-life uh, decision-making during ECLS, a, a very important area. Uh, the other, um, another advance is working groups. Uh, we've had a lot of discussion around these. You've heard about the, the innovation, the devices group led by Max, uh, but we've now created uh, a number of different working groups that we're ke very keen to have people being engaged in. So ECPR, mobilization, neurological outcomes, sustainability, innovation, um, ESOR or normothermic regional perfusion, uh, and infection on ECMO. Uh, these will be being supported uh, by the society and um, are available to members. So we You'll need to be an individual or centre member uh, for ELSO. Um, the, the goal will be to have the, each of the working groups contributing to the scientific program, both in topics but also potentially in speakers, and also encourage the development of abstracts, uh, publications for research, uh, surveys, coordination of, of primary research. Um, and please do send us uh, expressions of interest. They'll also be available on the website. Finally, we, I mentioned research earlier, um, and the thing that we do do as an organization is we provide uh, scientific grants each year. Uh, clearly, with COVID, everything got slightly lost, um, but we're back to providing this year four grants of 15,000 uh, euros uh, to support basic and clinical research in adult and pediatric populations. The goal for those research studies is that they uh, will be completed and then come back and uh, be supported to report at a future meeting. And it gives me great pleasure to announce the uh, winners of this year's 15,000 euro grants. Uh, there are four of them. And the first is from Dr. Weist, uh, a follow-up study to improve the medical care of patients with long-term VV ECMO therapy, or ECPR. The next is from Dr. Van Edem, uh, exploring the contact pathway during percutaneous mechanical circulatory support in the critically ill, start of a new era. From Dr. Pacoma, a retrospective study of drug disposition of selected drugs used during neonatal and pediatric ECMO. And Dr. Matucci, the development of a pilot artificial intelligence driven platform to guide red cell transfusion. So please join with me in congratulating the four grant recipients, and we look forward to hearing from them in the future. Thanks very much, Nick. Um, thank you for your attendance. I think we've managed to finish six minutes early. I hope it hasn't been too rushed as far as you're concerned. So there is time for a break before the well-being session. Thank you very much.